Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm going to read a creative nonfiction piece, and um, this is the second piece that I've written specifically in response to one of the Liminal Oath exhibits. Um, so my thanks goes to Kara and to the Liminal Gallery for giving me such wonderful writing prompts. Um, for the moment, this is simply named after the exhibit um, called Exchange 81. Route 81 became our pathway. We traveled almost the full length of it, from Binghamton to the edge of Virginia, getting off to make our way to Chapel Hill. Those were graduate school years, both of us in school with our first daughter and then our second. Each Christmas, we made our way south down the highway that we caught minutes from our rented duplex, beginning in piles of snow and the frigid temperatures of winter in upstate New York. Our breath snagged on paralyzed branches as we snuck ourselves out of the house, bundled in early morning. We transported suitcases and presents from home to car, finally carrying our daughter, still heavy and sleep, into the sharp sting of cold and into the waiting car seat. I sat in the back with her while my husband navigated our way, following the direction of birds. Going south, we knew we would find warmth. We traveled through a tiny bit of New York, then the length of Pennsylvania, clouds forming a low covering to sky, still keeping the air chill and gray. Finally, over the Mason-Dixon line into Maryland, the sky lifts, letting sun emerge into light. By Virginia, we knew we had broken through frost and fog to arrive into the clear blue warmth that our skin craved. Somewhere in Pennsylvania, we passed a sign that said, Black Swan. Our imaginations brushed over those words. Was it a warning for runaway slaves, or was it a sign of encouragement to keep heading north? Perhaps it was only the monotony of the winding road that made us wonder at the origins of those words and what they meant for us today. An African-American, Arab-American family heading south at the end of the 20th century. Our more than midway stop was Charlottesville, where friends lived. Harlan had taught with us in Egypt at the American University in Cairo, and his wife Janice was now a graduate student at UVA. They welcomed us with short sleeves and an overflowing bowl of pasta, along with a much needed reprieve from the endless hum of the highway. Christmas in North Carolina meant sunny walks and at least one unexpected day when the chill and the air retreated and allowed us to go out without jackets. At the end of the holiday, we became reluctant travelers as we made our way back up Route 81, keenly aware of the cold and snow that awaited us at the end of our journey. After five years of Binghamton winters and long road trips, my husband's job search led us back down the path of Route 81 to Holland's University in Roanoke, a town whose signs we must have passed numerous times on our trips. Boxes of books piled up in our apartment, ready to make yet another move, along with our cat who complained in consistent meows as we made our way to our new destination. Once we settled in this Blue Ridge Valley, a new location for our lives, I recognized its familiarity. The Waltons, which I had avidly watched as a child, took place somewhere within these mountains. <coughs> that show tugged at me when I was growing up as a young immigrant in America, trying to make sense of this vast new world. Something about the natural landscape different from anything I had known appealed to me. I had grown up in the urban landscape of Cairo, and we had settled in the suburbs of Boston. This environment with its green mountains and valleys held the appeal of a foreign land. But something about the large extended family on this show, all sharing a home, were called my own family structure in Egypt. And the meddling in everyone's affairs also had a familiar ring. I dreamt of having this fantasized life in my future, complete with seven children. For years, as an adult, I never spoke of my fondness for the show, recognizing the over-idealized lifestyle it portrayed, until, in passing conversation, my friend Ursula, who had immigrated from Germany, mentioned it. We found our common ground. She, too, had watched the show avidly when she first arrived in America and was drawn into its storylines and characters. Perhaps it was the simplicity of how each problem was resolved that appealed to us, unlike our own immigrant lives that seemed wrapped in complex knots. 
In John Guay, I saw a romantic version of my own desire to write and the family support I wished I had. Ursula recalled the constant refrain of good nights and perhaps the harmony of voices revealed her desire for an equally calm and loving family life. It seemed only just that the destiny of fate would lead us both to live so closely to the show's setting. Over the years in Roanoke, our family found itself once again bound on Route 81, heading north to make our way back to Binghamton to see friends and to Boston to visit my family. But we knew enough to limit these trips to the summer months. Among goats and chickens, we visited with our friends in Newark Valley just outside Binghamton, professors who were also farmers, a world distant from our own background. We milked goats and harvested hay and learned that this lifestyle remained appealing for us only in our imagination. Then on to Boston to visit my parents and revel in family gatherings complete with stuffed grape leaves and ongoing arguments accented by loud gestures and memories that faded into another country. Each time we returned with a stuffed van carrying all the things my parents offered us assuring us that we needed them. Our drive back south promised us lighter winters with gifts of sunny January days. We were fortunate to end up in a setting whose weather we had longed for on those long winter trips, leaving behind years of shoveling snow and wearing summer clothes only for a few miserly weeks. The south was more generous with its sunshine, and these mountains that surrounded our valley protected us from the harshest storms. Years later, our older daughter's college search led her to the least expected possibility from among the places she had applied, and we found ourselves heading back up 81 to drop her off at UVA. Once again, we retraced our paths. Our friends in Charlottesville had moved, and our trips there had stopped shortly after we came to Rona. But once again, 81 summoned us, and we delivered our daughter to her unexpected destiny. America is a vast country that stretches people across its borders. Our families' origins, African tribes insulated into cohesive communities, and Egyptian villages where houses expanded to accommodate children and their spouses, drew tight geographical lines that defined boundaries and kept families intact. In America, with its seemingly infinite possibilities, Families fragment and the roads traveled fade into an indecipherable pattern that can't be retraced. Route 81 has circled our lives from Binghamton to Chapel Hill, from Roanoke back to Binghamton and to Boston, from Roanoke to Charlottesville. Each time we travel this highway, we wrap another thread around our lives, tying us to people <coughs> we keep close, even through the distance of America's landscape. If we ever make another move, I know it will still be Route 81 that will take us there.